All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Aquarium of the Pacific's Online Academy. My name is Dana. I'm a member of our education department here, and I'm so excited for you all to join us in this next program because we're going to be diving in a little bit deeper to some of our kind of highlight species in our local habitats, uh, two fish in particular. Now, if you're hanging out and you've been watching for a while, we're going to be recapping what some of the characteristics of fish might be, what some of the characteristics of a local habitat might be, and then we're going to put them together and look at those two species, like I said. Now, if you're interested in participating, which we would love to have you do, you'll be seeing me on camera, but I am joined by two friends in the studio. I have James behind the controls. He's going to be controlling what's going on behind me over here. And then I have Allie off to the side who's going to be taking your questions and passing them in to me. Now, if you want to shoot us a question, please do. Our phone number is 562-286-1838. And we're going to be taking those questions live. Now, it is texting. Make sure you have adult permission. And remember that texting rates do apply. Now, with that, we're going to start making our first observations. All right, my friends. So behind me in just a moment, we're going to get our blue cavern uh, habitat on the screen. And I want you to just make some observations. If you recall, our blue cavern exhibit, which is this one right here, is modeled after a real dive site right here in Southern California found out at Catalina Island. Have you ever been to Catalina? We're going to be talking a little bit more about it after this, uh, later on in the program. And so I want you to think if you have been out there, if you have not, what does it look like, right? So again, it's modeled after a real site. The real blue cavern out at Catalina is about 100 feet deep, and then it just keeps on dropping off. Now, our exhibit here is not 100 feet, but divers who have been to the D blue cavern out at Catalina do say that it's a great representation of a kelp forest habitat. Now, kelp forest. Let's recall what that means. If you look right over here, especially right over here, we've got a lot kind of growing up in the background over here. Uh, this is all kelp or algae, okay? Now, giant kelp, like what you see back over here more, that is a really special species to our coastline because it's actually only found in about five areas around the world, Southern California being one of them. And kelp forest habitats, like you see right here with the rocks, uh, the sandy or rocky bottom, the kelp growing, and lots of different algae species. They support over 800 different animals. And like I said, we're going to talk about two of them in particular. So I'm going to step off screen and give you all a moment to explore this habitat a little bit without me in the way. So let's check out and see what it looks like. Ah, now while we're making our observations, Gage from Arizona. Welcome get back, Gage. We're so excited you're here was wondering about yellowtail. Do yellowtail like to live in kelp forests? That's a really great question, Gage. Now, yellowtail um, off of our coastline are usually out in open water. However, I have seen some young yellowtail swimming right along the edge of kelp forest habitats. I'm guessing that they're likely taking advantage of something called spillover. Um, in our marine protected areas. Now, we have marine protected areas set up all along our coast. In fact, Blue Cavern out at Catalina is an MPA. And spillover happens where within an MPA's boundaries, there's usually a lot of life because that area is protected. There's not much fishing going on. But animals, they don't know why, but they recognize that there's a lot of life in this area. And they'll kind of hang out on the outside and really take advantage of the feeding, even though uh, yellowtail aren't usually in the kelp forest. Now, Moon was asking, how big can great whites get? And Moon, I love this question because oftentimes when we talk kelp forest, we're not actually talking about our large predators like the great whites. But great white sharks are known to reach lengths of over 20 feet. Now, Historically, we always thought that that was too big to live in a kelp forest habitat. And yet, recently, we have received footage of great white sharks uh, cruising right through the kelp. So before, they kind of took advantage of uh, hanging out on the fringes, sort of like I mentioned with those yellowtail. And yet, uh, now, we, like I said, we have footage that shows that they do, in fact, cruise through the kelp. So who knows? Any Southern California divers out there, we'll have to keep our eyes open. All right, my friends, so I'm going to jump back into the screen here and um, kind of share what my observations were just now. Now, I did notice the rocks, right? Rocky reefs are another really important part of kelp forests. They usually kind of go hand in hand. Um, we also have all the kelp, like I mentioned. And you'll notice that it's very blue, very cold-looking water. Now, uh, water off of our coastline is what we call temperate, meaning it can fluctuate throughout the seasons depending on how warm or how cold it can be. 
And so right here, uh, Southern California is warmer than Northern, but it's still really chilly compared to waters down at the equator. And yet again, it can change back and forth. In fact, during El Nino, or if you recall recently, we had the blob. It was an anomaly of warm water sitting off of our coastline. Um, our surface temperatures reached over 80 degrees. And yet, I've also gone diving out there when it's like 65 or lower. And so again, our, ch our uh, temperature can change a lot. But this kind of blueness sort of demonstrates that cooler water temperature, right? So I also see a lot of fish, but are any of these fish particularly colorful? Hmm. It doesn't look like it. And yet, my uh, one of my favorite kelp forest animals is a Garibaldi. Now we're going to get a picture of a Garibaldi up on the screen here in just a moment. And what do you notice about this animal? Well, it's pretty colorful, right? In fact, it's bright orange. And so I mentioned that we are going to be talking in depth about two species that call our kelp forests home. The first one is going to be the individual right here. Now, Garibaldis are a group of, are, are in a group of fish known as damselfish. And damselfish have a couple characteristics that kind of help identify that family group. So if you look here, this fish is what we call compressed uh, this direction, laterally compressed. Depressed fish would be squished flat. A compressed fish is like this. So if you were looking at it, it's not going to be big and round like this. Instead, it's going to be nice and flat. So if we were looking head on to this animal, they'd be a very thin uh, animal. Now, damselfish also have very um, kind of squat bodies, right? So they're compressed this way, but their bodies in general, they look pretty beefy. However, this is the largest of our damselfish. They don't actually get that big. Garibaldi can grow uh, to be up to about 14 inches, but usually they're smaller than a foot, maybe right around a foot at their max. Um, so again, that's only about this big, right? which actually looks a lot better, right? It's like when I'm going fishing, this is about a fish, it's like that's a foot, right? But really it's only about that big, maybe uh, shoulder to shoulder, if that. Now, damselfish also um, are known for, they usually have these really great uh, dorsal fins. Um, damselfish swim with their pectoral flippers. We'll take a look and see if we can get any footage of that later on. Um, but this is a great fish off of our coastline. And it's really important to California because this is actually the California State Marine Fish. Now, take a look at this screen behind me. Um, there is an orange fish right here, but that's not a Garibaldi. That's a type of rockfish. However, down, oh, he just swam off the screen over there and then right there. There's our Garibaldi. And so if you notice, compared to a lot of the other animals on this screen right now, those orange ones really stand out, right? But why do they stand out? Why doesn't this fish want to blend in with its habitat? Why isn't it green or brown or blue or black or anything that's going to be kind of a muted color down underwater? Um, well, if you were an animal, there, there they went. Oh, they swam off again. Uh, if you were an animal that lived in kind of a muted habitat, hi there and you are bright orange, what might that mean? Hmm. Well, if I wasn't afraid about hiding and I kind of flashed these colors, it could mean a couple things. It might mean that I'm venomous, right? It might mean that I'm poisonous. It might mean that I have something on me that's gonna defend myself in a way that you do not wanna get close. Now that's not the case for Garibaldi. Garibaldi instead, their defense kind of comes from their behavior. That little fish over here is incredibly territorial. In fact, uh, you can ask almost any California diver if they've ever had a face-to-face -face, uh, moment with a Garibaldi, and I can almost guarantee that we have, okay? Um, I think a, a common question as a diver is, well, like, what kind of animal encounters have you gotten or have you had in the past? And, and I always like to bring up these Garibaldi because oftentimes this little foot-long fish it's going to be the most aggressive animal in that kelp forest. And when I say that, what I mean is that they are not afraid to go after anyone or anything who's getting into their territory. And their territories as an individual are usually about 10 to 15 square feet. So probably about the size of this room that I'm hanging out in. Now, I know it looks like I'm hanging out in Blue Cavern, uh, but really I'm in a studio that has uh, a big green screen behind me. And, you know, I have James in here behind the camera. And so it's a pretty small area. Um, and a Garibaldi might try to defend this whole place. Uh, maybe the size of like a, a bathroom, like a full bathroom, not a half bath. Okay. And so uh, maybe two of those. But Garibaldi can defend that entire area. And they do that by chasing uh, their 
their competitors away, okay? And when they do that, they use this really loud kind of croaking or clicking or drumming noise. Uh, and people always ask, like, what does it sound like underwater? And oftentimes they assume if you were to drop down underwater that it's going to be really, really quiet. But in reality, all sorts of ocean animals are making lots of noises. And the Garibaldi is one of those when you're in a kelp forest. And so it'll sound like a drum or a bang or a boom or a clack. And um, you know that there's a Garibaldi nearby. Now, let's bring up that picture of the Garibaldi one more time, make some other observations. And as you're taking a look at this fish, I'm going to answer um, a couple other questions that we've got. Julian and Liam are asking what types of fish travel in schools. That's a really great question, you two. In our kelp forest, oftentimes we'll have sardines or mackerel swimming around in schools. But those yellowtail that we talked about earlier are also a schooling fish. Now, how do fish swim in schools? Well, they have what's called a lateral line that runs down the length of their body. If, if we were able to see it on the Garibaldi, it would kind of run right along here or so, okay? And uh, they feel the movement of the water as their buddies swim by them. And so that's how they're kind of paying attention to where predators are. Now, Denver wanted to know, do otters go on top of kelp? That's a really great question, Denver, and I'm assuming you're asking that because you've made some observations of otters out in their natural habitat hanging out in a kelp forest. And yeah, sea otters uh, do like to hang out in kelp forests. In fact, they feed on a lot of things that live um, on the bottom of a kelp forest habitat, such as our purple sea urchins. I believe we have a photo of a purple sea urchin if we want to bring that up. There we go. So this is a purple sea urchin right here. And this blade that it's uh, sitting on is actually a giant kelp blade. So if you're wondering what that looks like in detail, this is one of those giant kelp blades. Now our sea otters, they like to eat those sea urchins. And it's really good because the sea urchins eat the kelp. In fact, sea otters and urchins and kelp are a really great example of what we call a trophic cascade. Now, those are some big scientific words, but a trophic level is kind of like level within the food chain or the food web. And a cascade, basically, it talks about the interactions between those animals. Now, um, last one before we jump back to some of our fish facts here. Sadie wanted to know where along the California coast are these fish, the Garibaldi, found? Well, that's a great question, Sadie. So as you see this kelp forest behind me, kelp can be found all up and down the California coast. However, Garibaldi are typically found from Monterey Bay down to uh, Magdalena Bay in Baja, California. But most of them are found um, south of Point Conception. If you want to take a look at a map, Point Conception is the point where the state of California makes that big turn on the coastline. Um, so that was a really great question. One last time, we're going to go back to that picture of the Garibaldi here. What do we notice? Well, if you look really closely, that mouth, although the fish is small, that mouth looks quite mighty. So let's take a look right here. Oops, that's right where I'm at. So this mouth right here, they have teeth, right? And you can look really, really tiny teeth along the front. Um, and what do they use that mouth for? Well, Garibaldi like to hang out in the kelp forest and they feed on animals that live down on the sea floor. In fact, they're going to be eating a lot of invertebrates. Now, again, those are animals without a backbone. Some of their favorite foods are tube worms. They like bryozoans. Bryozoans are like a, an encrusting animal that grow over rocks and on kelp blades. They'll also feed on little crabs, um, little sea stars, really anything that those teeth can, can get their mouths on, right? Or that those, uh, get anything that that fish can get their teeth on, really. And um, I've even been known to have a Garibaldi come and check out what I taste like, right? Mostly it's because they're being territorial and they're trying to, the, to chase me off. But it's really interesting when one of these animals comes over to you and you're like, oh, but you're so small. And then all of a sudden you're realizing that they're trying to get rid of you. Uh, and you can feel those little teeth. So that was a really great question, um, a really great observation that we made there if you look closely. All right. Now, what else are we wondering about this animal? I want you to think for a moment and ask yourself any last questions as you take a look at it. Let's see, a really common question we get is what do the adults look like? Are males and females the same? And is there anything different about their babies? And those are all really great questions. So we're going to check, uh, check out what they look like right now. Now, this one about, oh. <laughs> This one behind me looks a little bit different than that bright orange one that we just saw. So this one, this is an adult Garibaldi, and both the male and the female looks like this. 
But how do you tell the difference between the two? Well, usually at that point, you're going to be looking for behavior. Now, our male Garibaldis, they're really fun to watch because they are actually the ones who create the nest and defend that territory that I talked about. So within their 10 to 15 square foot radius, uh, they're going to be looking for an area that they can kind of clear out. They're going to remove debris and animals and anything that's in their way. And they're going to create this beautiful nest, clean area for a female to come lay her eggs. So again, behavior is how you're going to tell the males from the females. Now, the females can be very picky, all right? They're going to be looking for a mate that has a nice clean area, a nice safe territory. And also, if other females have already laid their eggs there, the next female is going to be looking at those eggs going, hmm, do they look well taken care of? Can I eat some of them? That's right, my friends. Garibaldis will actually eat their own eggs. Mostly it's the female. So once a female lays her eggs, the male is going to chase her away because he's like, I don't want you to now eat them, right? And yet, the male's been known to eat some eggs as well, sometimes to clear space for another female uh, to deposit her eggs, which seems kind of counterintuitive, right? Now, um, let's jump back to those babies. So once they lay their eggs, once they hatch and all of that stuff, uh, babies, the eggs are going to hatch. They're going to go up to the water in the water column, hang out on the surface for a bit. And then they're going to become plankton and drift around, feeding on all sorts of goodies uh, that drift through our ocean's waters. Then once they settle, about a month after they're born, they're going to settle onto the ground and they're going to start to look like this individual right here. Now, it's bright orange, just like its parents. But what are some differences that you see here, right? Well, babies are known for this really bright blue spot. And they're also known for this beautiful... Um, line along their, do along their dorsal fin, along their tail, and along uh, their fins on the bottom as well. I'm kind of blocking the view here. But that bright blue fluorescent lining uh, really tells you that you're looking at a young, young Garibaldi. Now, as they age, this bright blue spot right here tends to disappear a bit, but they will maintain these smaller blue spots um, up until they're about six inches in length. So uh, they're, they're, they're less vibrant, but you can still tell they're young. Now, why do their young ones have spots, okay? So I mentioned the territorialness of their adults, especially the males. And the young ones, they don't quite have a territory yet. They're still figuring out their life. They're still figuring out where they want to settle. Do they want to live in Southern California? Do they want to live in Idaho? Do they want to live in Arizona? Do they want to live, right? I'm just kidding, you guys. They're just looking for their own territory within the oceans, of course. But that blue spot and that blue pattern on their body is kind of their way of saying, hey, don't mind me. I'm not going to try to steal your territory. I'm just cruising through. It's kind of their ticket to uh, move safely through territories in the ocean as they, they learn to find their own spot. Now, we do have one question from Nora that just came in. And Nora is asking, what's my favorite kind of fish? Oh, Nora, that's a really hard one to ask because there's so many amazing fish here in our own uh, state as well as all around the world. I think one of my favorite fish is called the blacksmith, and it's actually related to the Garibaldi here. It's another type of damselfish. We're going to see if we can pull up a photo of a blacksmith, because if you recall, I talked about the characteristics that kind of alert you to the fact that you're looking at a damselfish, and the body shape is one of them. Now, something that I love about blacksmith is when they're babies, the, the adults are kind of a muted blue and green and gray, but when they're babies... Uh, they have this really bright little yellow tail and then a bright blue head. And so they're kind of this tropical fish moving through our kelp forest and rocky reef habitats here off of our coast. Uh, but for the most part, these bright Garibaldi are going to be the brightest fish out there. And then the Garibaldi and the blacksmith are two, the only two damselfish that are typically seen off of our coastline. So uh, it looks like James is working on pulling up that damsel or that that blacksmith photo. And then after that, we're going to roll into our next fish here. So let's see if I can get off screen and show you one more look at our beautiful baby Garibaldi. Ooh, I did mention, what was that? We got a blacksmith. Let's see it. There we go. So this is uh, adult blacksmith. Remember I mentioned those kind of blues and grays, but what's similar about the body type? Well, they're compressed laterally, right? Meaning if we were looking at it uh, like this, it's going to be a really thin fish, right? Um, and then they have that kind of beefy body. So even though the fish is thin, it still looks pretty, pretty robust. Uh, it's got a kind of similar face, a little bit different shaped tail, right? 
Um, but for the most part, they do have a very similar body type. And again, the only two damselfish really found off of our coast. Uh, so great question, Nora, but that's one of my favorites. <laughs> now, I mentioned that we are going to be talking about two fish, okay? And so the next fish that I really want to highlight off of our coastline is going to be uh, a really special fish. It's going to be the biggest fish that we usually see in the kelp forest habitat, and it's going to show up on the screen behind me here. Now, this is our giant sea bass, okay? What are some things that we can uh, notice about this fish? What are the first things that might stand out to you? Hmm. <laughs> Somebody said they're grumpy. Yeah, if you look at its face right here, uh, we actually drew this fish in a Draw With Me program on Wednesday. And at first I was like, oh man, I don't know how to draw a giant sea bass. Until my friend told me, well, it's a football with a frown. And as soon as I did that, it really did start to look like a giant sea bass. So uh, yeah, they are known for kind of having that, that little grumpy smile or lack of a smile right over here. That doesn't mean the fish is actually grumpy. It's just what it looks like. Uh, but I also noticed this tail right here. This is a broom-shaped tail. Now the tail can tell us a lot about a fish and its movement. Uh, I want you to think of the fastest fish that you know of. Hmm. Well, we had a question about the yellowtail earlier. So what do our yellowtail look like? Well, if you look at the yellowtail's tail, they are yellow and they're also forked. They're kind of like this, okay? And fish that have forked tails like that are usually very fast and can stay fast for a long time. Now, fish like our giant sea bass that has a broom-shaped tail, those animals tend to be a little slower. They can do bursts of speed, uh, but they don't last very long, okay? So they're like the sprinters that die out really fast. Um, if you are a swimmer or a runner, you know, you'll know what I'm talking about. Ah, here's our yellow tail tail. So again, yellow and forked. That's a very fast fish. Now, um, let's jump back to that giant sea bass there. What else do we notice about this fish? Well, we talked about the tail, okay? Uh, another thing I can assume just by looking at this tail, I know that it can do bursts of speed, but for the most part, it's a slow mover. If I combine what I know about the tail and then take a look at its mouth, this fish is an ambush predator. Now, what that means is it's usually gonna be sitting in wait, and as other prey fish come by, uh, it can use that tail to make a burst of speed and then it's gonna open this really big mouth. Let's see if I can line my hand up. It's gonna go whoa, really big mouth. And this fish opens its mouth so fast and so big that it actually creates a vacuum. So our giant sea bass are pretty much uh, the biggest predators that the normal fish in our kelp forests uh, have to deal with. There are also other predators, of course. There are those sea otters I mentioned. Um, we do get the sharks swimming through, but our giant sea bass are really, really big apex predators in our kelp forest. Here's another example. Actually, I think sometimes they'll open their mouth here. So let's see what this, this individual. These are actually the fish that we have in our blue cavern exhibit right here. So you can see uh, there's a leopard shark swimming in, uh, but this one is coming in nice and close to the camera over here. You can see they've got those real big eyes. Oop, too high. Big eyes, kind of buggy eyes. Check it out. <laughs> and you can see that mouth. See, there's that football frown. There you go. Oh, man. Right? All right, my friends. Um, so you notice that broom-shaped tail is working. It's moving nice and slow. Is this what I think it is? Is it going to come in? And yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Check out, see if we can see its mouth do anything. Nope, it gave up. Maybe another one? <laughs> so you'll notice that we do have three giant sea bass here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Um, two of them are an older mated pair, and the other one is a little bit younger. We got the youngest one in 2012. It was already an adult at that time. Um, and our two uh, older adults, they've been here since 1998. They're what we call our charter animals. Um, they've been here since the opening of the aquarium. Now, something that's really special about the fish that we have here, we were able to talk about the baby Garibaldi. Let's take a moment to talk about our baby giant sea bass. Now, giant sea bass, when they're this big, they're brown, they're gray, they've got spots, uh, but they blend in with their habitat pretty well but their babies look really, really different. Let's see if we can get a view of what those babies look like. Look how cute it is! So this is a baby giant sea bass. What's one of the first things that you notice about it? Hmm. Well, I notice that it's orange. 
right? It's kind of an orange brown, and it's got a lot of polka dots all over it. Now, baby giant sea bass um, are really, really small, right? They can get to be up to six feet in length, and yet when they're born, they start out as plankton. They're a little larva drifting through the ocean, and then when they settle, they're only about this big, right? Maybe the size of like a penny or a quarter, kind of in between there. That's when we really start to notice them. Now, our adults are usually found kind of on the fringes of kelp forest in about 60 to 70 feet or, of water or so. The babies are known to hang out in uh, rocky reefs or over sandy bottoms and in, and in like eelgrass beds um, or seagrass beds around 65 feet or so. Now, one thing that's really, really special is I mentioned that those two adults in our exhibit are, mated, are a mated pair. And when I say that, what I mean is that they have reproduced. And that's how we are able to be like, yep, for sure, male, female, right? That's usually your biggest clue. Now, those animals were successfully, uh, successfully reproduced here at the aquarium. And we have a young fish that we might be able to see in an amber forest video. We'll see if we can check it out. And that fish was born in 2016. It started at that itty bitty little one. Let's see. Can we see? Ah, he's hiding right there. He's behind this algae. There he is. Now, he's starting to look a little bit more brown, a little bit more gray. And that's because as they age, they lose that bright orange. Uh, but again, they start out from itty bitty. We watched Utaka. That's Utaka right there. Uh, we watched Utaka grow from that tiny little plankton, and now Utaka is about this big. And uh, it's really exciting to watch these fish grow because we're still learning a lot about our giant sea bass. Now, giant sea bass here off the coast of California are protected. They're not our state marine fish like the Garibaldi, but they are placed under protection, both the Envirom uh, Endangered Species Act as well as all of our marine protected areas. Um, and that is because giant sea bass, like those ones that you were seeing swim around before, they're very, very curious fish. Because of their size, there's not a lot of predators um, that go after them, except for maybe a large shark. And so, uh, even a scuba diver or a free diver or a spear fisherman, they'll usually go check them out, which kind of led to their demise. They were a large, curious fish, and that made them an easy target. Now, we started to see the population of giant sea bass decline, and the state of California stepped in and said, that's it, no more, we're not going to fish for them. And since then, those places went into protection in the 70s, we're starting to see or we believe that their population is starting to increase. Now, we're still doing a lot of scientific uh, research to figure out what those numbers are currently. But those spots that I mentioned before, can we get the baby back up behind me? Let's see. So those spots that I mentioned before, um, that's actually a way that we can identify these fish as individuals. You'll notice when they're really, really young, they have lots and lots of spots. And then if we can get another adult on the screen, um, as they age, they lose those spots. And yet, they do still have polka dots. Okay. Now we've found that if I were to go out there and I'm diving or I'm snorkeling or I'm doing whatever I want to do out in the ocean and I go and take a picture, we can then analyze that photo against a lot of other photos of giant sea bass and we can recognize spot patterns and say that fish and that fish are the same. And we have to get one from the left side and the right side. And then we go and that fish and that fish are the same. And that fish and that fish are the same. And all of a sudden we're starting to compile all of this data to get an idea of what their population looks like. So my friends, what I want you to take away from this is the fact that these are two very special fish found off of our coastline. And yet there's still so much that we can explore and discover about them. We're going to wrap up this program by answering uh, a question or two from you joining us in on the program uh, on that phone number again. Otherwise, we're going to be coming back at 2 o'clock for an ocean exploration. I mentioned that there's a lot we can learn about these fish. Trust me, there is a lot we can learn about the ocean. So tune in at 2 o'clock to learn about that. But first, um, I want to share an observation that Denver made. And Denver says, the giant sea bass don't look happy. And you're right, Denver. <laughs> they definitely don't, right? I mentioned that football with a frown. And now I can't unsee it. So, uh, Allie, are there any last questions coming in? Nope. All right, my friends. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about two of our favorite fish here off of our California coastline. And again, we'll see you back at two o'clock for the ocean exploration. All right. Have a wonderful afternoon.